We're really coming to the inflection point where generative design is going to start to mean something different. What Autodesk has released inside uh, Fusion 360 with their generative design technology set the benchmark for the industry in terms of what is possible with generative design. How would someone build or set up a workflow when it comes to generative design? The focus on programming skills on computer science in engineering degrees has risen. We have tools like Grasshopper and of course now Sonera that enable users to create their own algorithms to approach the same type of problem in a different manner. Now you can take these process steps and automate them away. Also, it frees up a lot of your time. Do you think the technology is the bottleneck or is it the processes, the people, or is it both? Through being able to combine all of these in an automated workflow, you can go further exploration of the solution space than before. How do I decide as an engineer or just as an individual in general, when is the right time to learn a new tool? The best time for an engineer to start picking up one of these tools is when you're bored with your current tasks. I think what drives most of us crazy is when we have to go back and solve the same problem over and over again. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a new podcast episode. Today, I have two specialists on my show, namely Andrew and Daniel. Welcome to the show. Hi, Yosef. Thanks, Yosef. Uh, can you give the audience maybe a little introduction to yourselves? Maybe Andrew and then uh, Daniel will follow. Sure. So uh, currently, I work for Sonera. I'm one of our product managers. I'm also our software partnership manager, but I've spent almost all of my career um, after university working in the engineering software space, doing roles like tech support at Autodesk, product owner for additive manufacturing. I was a uh, sales engineer at uh, Anthropology, product manager at Hexagon, and now uh, here at Sonera. So a lot of uh, experience in the engineering software industry, a lot of different perspectives from all those customer conversations over the past few years. Really, really cool. Danya? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Daniel. I'm a business operations lead here at Sonera. Joined about three years ago and went through a few different stations uh, inside of Sonera from customer success to um, you know, the academy. Uh, played a little role in uh, developing uh, some courses uh, that you might uh, use in the future. Um, my history is a little bit uh, different than Andrew's. I haven't been in uh, tech or in software much. I come from more the engineering side, the um, few years at Mercedes-Benz and before at an engineering service provider doing some projects for, for example, Airbus and Ariana. And um, yeah, before that, I started computational engineering science in Aachen. Very good. So you talked about your engineering background and brings us to the topic of um, the podcast, which is generative engineering. I think this is Daniel, where you had your background, right? So maybe tell us the story of how you got actually or how you fell in love with generative design. And then Andrew can uh, follow up with like, what are actually the misconceptions in engineering about generative design? Sure. Um, so generative design, I came to it because it's kind of also the outset of our, uh, of the studies that I did. Um, computational engineering science is a mix of computer science, maths and engineering. So what they wanted to create is a study that um, teaches engineers in the typical engineering use cases how to develop new methods, how to develop new algorithms, and then also gives them the con computer science background to be able to implement those methods, implement those algorithms. And um, that's what we did a lot, obviously, in the studies. And uh, also in my master's thesis, for example, I um, wrote about the comparison of gener generative design about topology optimization and um, yeah, try to find new algorithms that help you develop uh, products and that help you um, yeah, integrate different aspects into the development process when you have it completely driven by algorithms. And yeah, mm -hmm. that was always a, an area of interest of mine. And um, here I am um, working in a company doing, well, it's kind of generative design adjacent, I would say. Yeah. I think you've written your master thesis also on generative design or algorithms, right? Yes. Um, it was um, developing some use cases uh, or developing a method and then uh, applying this method on some use cases. Cases, And it was about um, interacting with an algorithm. You can compare it kind of with the interaction that you nowadays have uh, with refinement of prompts in generative uh, AI. Um, Obviously not on that level, but I used uh, evolutionary algorithms and stopped them at certain points in the evolution and let the designer choose some different designs to uh, continue the modifications of and um, 
yeah, uh, it was a lot of fun to do that. Very, very insightful. Before I'm jumping the gun here, I'm talking about the misconceptions. And from your point of view, like, how do you define generative design? Because as Daniel already mentioned, AI came in, like, and people think about this generative design thing as kind of a, a brother a sister, maybe of like this LLM thing that came up. Um, how do you define it? And like, how do you see fitting in into the R&D process of engineers? Yeah, I think uh, for me, generative design is one of these terms that uh, I guess really got coined by Autodesk maybe 10 years ago or so. Um, to mean this idea of generating multiple designs um, in the mechanical design space um, from using generally topology optimization algorithms and some other kind of fancy computational design techniques behind behind the scenes. Um, but I think we're, we're really coming to the inflection point where generative design is going to start to mean something different. I think we've had this point where uh, what Autodesk has done and others have done has been really incredible for expanding the solution space for folks. But now we're going to start to see um, with all of these large language models, these things start to come together and mm. really having these new advanced uh, AI techniques start to apply in the mechanical design space, which will be really interesting. So what is generative design? I think it's uh, the term varies so much from person to person. I don't know that there's a, a single definition that we could really use today because it can be everything it, it can be nothing in a sense uh, that is a very a diplomatic answer i guess um, however for me a generative design is in the very basic definition everything that lets you um, or lets algorithms explore a high number of design possibilities so yeah these algorithms could be then just some rule rules, different uh, sets of rules or evolutionary algorithms like I use in uh, the thesis or LLMs or whatever. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think we're going to, it's kind of tying into how these things work versus I guess what they're actually doing for the end user in a sense. Um, and I think, yeah, as you said, these these techniques are going to start to come together a lot more in the, the not too distant uh, future. And I think the the interesting thing is going to start to be more end users actually creating these algorithms more and more than just receiving kind of um, capabilities from from software vendors. Yeah, interesting debate. We'll get back to that at a later point. Um, I think, Andrew, you have extensive experience in how what tools actually exist in the market when it comes to generative design. Could you name a couple of those? And like, maybe the next question then to Daniel would be, like, we defined the term generative design, but what are some of the limitations of generative design and where we're heading towards, like, maybe in five to 10 years, maybe? Andrew, let's maybe get started with the tool, tool landscape. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, as I said before, the industry really, for me, all started at least in the commercial software space with um, what Autodesk has mm -hmm. uh, released inside uh, Fusion 360 with their gender design technology there. I think that kind of set the the benchmark for the industry in terms of what is possible with gender of design. Um, but in parallel, we have tools like Grasshopper and, of course, now Sonera that enable users to create the, their own algorithms to approach the same type of problem in a different manner. Um, of course, then you have all of sorts of topology optimization solutions as well that uh, if you think about like um, uh, Apex gender design from, from Hexagon or the uh, Amendate uh, plugin for Scenera, these are generative design solutions. And I think to Daniel's point, this idea of creating uh, multiple designs or exploring the solution space is technically possible with most topology optimization tools, but then you need to tie it into other tools like Scenera or other pedo tools um, to really get that added benefit of, of searching that solution space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, because in the end, if you have something that is a rule set, then this rule set with a certain set of input parameters will always uh, um, come up with the same output. Now with generative AI and the prompts, I guess that's not directly true anymore. But normally, if you have like very specific rules, you run them with uh, parameters, it's the same output. And then the designer has to modify the rules or modify the input parameters to get a different output. So that's why we need, uh, for example, a tool like Scenera uh, versus just going and manually always um, yeah, changing the input uh, parameters. 
so we can automate this design of experiment studies and so on mm -hmm. but i, I think I think, um, you know, if we look at tools like uh, Stable Diffusion that are doing mm -hmm. this uh, image generation, you know, the, the concept that they have, I guess, is they, they feed in uh, an image that's entirely noise. And that's the randomness that helps them generate new designs or, or new images from the same inputs each time. And I guess uh, that's somewhat the, the analog that we need to start to bring to the mechanical design space is how do we vary the uh, maybe the starting solution space or design space enough that you get these different outcomes out at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. What is the AI bit in the generative AI space? Like what is the AI part? Like what does it actually do behind the scenes? Not from an algorithmic point of view, but maybe how does it enable or empower engineers in the industries, different industries? Whoever wants to go first. It's an open, open question. Because I mean, I mean, you have to draw the line right between generative design and generative AI. So, what is the AI bit doing for us engineers? I would say it's augmenting our work. There's a lot of discussion around um, what's the use of generative AI in different disciplines. And for us in engineering, for now, with the same tools as everybody is using ChatGPT or now the Microsoft Copilot or Bard or uh, Gemini, I guess now, um, it's always augmenting our work and if you uh, look to the past it was computer aided design but was it really aided or did it just give you some things to replace your um, like pen and paper with um, maybe generative ai will allow us to put some real aid into the process for engineers yeah, I mean, I would almost say there, there to me, there isn't a, really a generative AI product for engineering. Sure, there's generative AI products for design aspects, but I don't think we've seen that that breadth come of solving actual engineering problems with generative AI solutions uh, today. And that's probably really where we need to go as an industry is um, stepping outside of just uh, generating CAD designs or meshes or um, implicit representations of geometry but actually how do we generate the engineering process um, that's needed to create these parts or validate these parts rather than just a, a single kind of geometric representation. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think we have to clarify is what Daniel mentioned kind of where Cinera ties into this kind of workflow or like the different steps that you can build instead of Cinera. Can you maybe walk us through like, um, how would someone build or set up a workflow when it comes to generative design? Um, let's say they have a specific objective. Um, why scenario on the market? Like what problems do you guys solve? Yeah, I think that's, uh, scenario is trying to allow you to automate kind of any engineering process. And if we take generative, um, design, generative engineering as an example of maybe a process that you want to, to go about automating, well, we're connecting to all of your, uh, standard CAD tools. So if you're working with uh, Siemens NX or PTC Creo or Autodesk Inventor, these sorts of products, we can start to bring those parametric models into the process. Maybe you're using a topology optimization solution like OptiStruct or Hexagon Amendate or, or Rafinex, you can start to connect those together. And then we're enabling you to tie into your simulation tools, uh, whether it's Nastran or Abacus or OptiStruct. So you can start to connect all of these products that have traditionally been somewhat separate from one another inside a single workflow. And now you can imagine if you can automate that process in this visual programming environment, then it's very easy to iterate through lots of different designs. And really that's the key is once you can automate a process, then you can replay it continuously to generate this expanded solution space. And of course you can also start to tie in cool, um, you know, AI machine learning algorithms like reduced order modeling, um, where we connect into like uh, products from Siemens or Altair. So you can speed up that generation process by not having to run the full validation. Um, you can actually use a, a model that you've already generated to validate some of your designs initially. And through formalizing everything in this kind of workflow, so having it in a specific form, you're also able to go much deeper into the workflow itself, into the process generated um, or that generates the part or whatever you want to um, automate and find the levers or the tweaks that you can do to improve the outcomes even more. So um, 
yeah, the formalization aspect is, I guess, uh, quite important here. Mm -hmm. When we talk about specific KPIs like time savings, cost savings, or some other KPIs, could you mention some of those? Like, what can engineers, and maybe especially C level people who might listen to the podcast, um, get out of su such a solution um, like Sonera? It's definitely um, time savings. And um, in result of that, of obviously cost savings, um, but we target much higher efficiency and effectiveness of engineers. So if you have had a lot of manual steps in your process until now, and now you can take these process steps and automate them away and then just replay them instead of coming up and doing all the same manual steps again and again and again, obviously you are free to do whatever else you want to do in your engineering work. But also, it frees up um, a lot of your time. I think one of the things that really speaks to me is this uh, ability to align engineers better um, by mm -hmm. documenting this process visually. So, mm -hmm. uh, I think for most of us on this call, we've we've probably uh, written a Python script at some point in our lives, and then we've tried to share that with somebody else or try to use somebody else's Python script. And sure, uh, that script may run, but if I want to uh, augment the one that Daniel's written, uh, I better, uh, I'm better off starting from scratch sometimes. And that's also where Scenario comes into play, where everything's visually documented. It's very easy for engineers to share their work with one another. Um, and as we know, engineers maybe are not the best communicators sometimes. Um, having this in a visual manner is, is a lot easier for everyone to, to pick up and learn. Maybe even some of the, the managers out there looking to understand what's going on inside the engineering process. Absolutely. And I think it's a huge benefit to the managers, but then an engineer might argue, well, if it's a knowledge capturing system, doesn't my uniqueness go away? Is that kind of a misconception, you think, from an engineering point of view? I, I would say so. I mean, I think... For most of us that have studied engineering, we want to solve uh, interesting problems. We want to solve unique problems. I think what uh, drives most of us crazy is when we have to go back and solve the same problem over and over again, um, because I've, I've done that before. Why do I have to do this again? And that's really where a scenario comes into play is uh, you don't have to solve the same problems that you've solved before. You can spend your time focused on solving new and interesting problems um, because that's where engineers will really add value is creating those new problem or solving those new problems, creating new processes in mm -hmm. spaces that we haven't done before. Yeah. I don't care if an algorithm takes away my ability or augments my ability to export, open another tool, import, and do that uh, 10,000 times. Um, then that's fine for me. <laughs> Absolutely. I think what people have to understand, I, I'm not sure how much engineers know Zapier, like this kind of automation tool for different tools that you're using. And this is kind of the, the Zapier for engineers, I would always like to say, because you can just take the tedious work and get it done with Sonera in this case, and just focus on the more important um, aspects or tasks um, in your day-to-day -day work. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew talked about the inflection point, which kind of reminds me of the Gartner hype cycle, right? At some point, like people were like super excited about a specific technology like ChatGPT, for example. And then this, that is kind of like, oh, okay, now I get it. It's not doing everything I want. It's not artificial super intelligence. And then at some point, that's kind of a plateau, understanding what this tool can actually do. For generative design, what do you guys think? Where are we at? At the moment is it like at the hype where we say hey this is amazing it can do everything for us or is it more like at the the downward phase where it's like okay now i understand engineers try to realize or realize what it's actually capable of i think um if you look at the curve though it normally does this kind of thing yeah. um there have been developments in generative design over the last years but i think we're just at the beginning of everything and um, so I would say before the first peak, even just at the beginning, and maybe the uh, generative AI topic will push us onto the hype. And if we see super good results and some tools that might, uh, might come up, um, it will go up, 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 up. But um, I wouldn't say if you zoom out, we're anywhere uh, like further than the beginning. Maybe Andrew, you have different oh. opinion. Since 10 years, uh, you have been working in software companies. I, I would completely different opinion. I, I would say we've, mm -hmm. we've at least gone through the uh, initial peak. Um, so I think in the, you know, 2017, 2018, I think there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm about uh, gender design and what the possibilities were. 
I think we've seen over the past years, it's very difficult to actually automate the design of a manufacturable geometry. Um, and I think we'll start to see that change over the next few years and we'll start to rise out of this kind of trough of uh, disillusionment mm -hmm. um, because I think there's a lot of technologies that are, that are coming out now that will really enable this um, design of manufacturable geometries in an automated manner. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you think the technology is the bottleneck or is it the, the process is the people or is it both? I, I think it's the, from my experience, I think it's the technology. I think we've seen that people are willing to adopt this and try this out. I mean, the, the number of engineers that have tried uh, large language models and image generation tools. I mean, it's, it's all over LinkedIn today. If you look at uh, any content you see there, half of it's uh, AI generated images. I know we use it internally for some things. Um, I think it's not the engineers or the people. It's, it's really the challenges that we're trying to solve are really difficult. If you think about generating a design of an automotive component, there's very much a right or wrong answer to a design there. Whereas generating an image, uh, for instance, with a generative AI model, there's not really a right or wrong answer to some extent for that uh, design. But for an automotive part, well, it has to go through all of my FEA simulations, my durability analysis, my manufacturability analysis has to be um, meet the right cost targets. That's a much harder metric to meet to then fit into the larger engineering process than generating an image or some text. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other thoughts, Daniel, on this? Um, I'm still thinking about the hype cycle because when you compare this, um, the hype that were, was there around generative design, um, I'm looking at the broad mass of engineers that exist today, then how many of these knew actually about generative design and what it was and what it could do and what maybe companies said it could do. I think it was just a very, very small part. And if you now ask any uh, engineer about generative AI, as you said, LinkedIn is full of it. So that for me is hype. So that's why I'm saying maybe zoomed in, there was this very small hype cycle inside of the, let's say, uh, space. But for the broader like engineering community, I'm not sure we were there yet. Um, but um, I guess uh, we will see about uh, the developments in the future and how that uh, goes. So if we find a method, for example, that really can create these, uh, let's say, automotive parts reliably with all of the features that the development today asks for, and also the um, yeah, transparency that is needed, the um, traceability of how did this part came to be. Um, because obviously, if we think about automotive, if we think even about aerospace, there's a lot of certification that needs to be hap uh, that needs to happen. And yeah, I think um, we will see if the developments are good, a much, much broader hype um, about this. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that we upskill the engineers like for future generations? I mean, Sinero does a great job, right, in terms of like documentation, the academy and so on and so forth. Do you feel, Andrew, you mentioned that engineers, yeah, they are kind of open-minded, open to new solutions, but what about the, the sea levels? Yeah, I, th I think most people are open to new solutions. It's about finding the right uh, business case or use case to start to, to adopt them. Mm -hmm. um, but, but your point about future generations, to me, this also circles back to this visual documentation aspect, because I think we, we see in a lot of industries, the older generation of workers is leaving, or maybe even uh, certain industries have kind of stopped um, altogether. And that knowledge of how to design and engineer parts for them becomes incredibly difficult. So I think uh, in France right now, the nuclear industry, they have a real problem is they don't know what went into the thought process of initially designing some of these power plants and now how do we take that forward with our new engineers we're going to design the next generation um, of power plants so it's it's this challenge of how do we transfer this knowledge to earlier generations but also kind of archive it so that other people can access it or maybe not other people but ai models or, or 
or, or things of this nature that will enable us to understand why parts were engineered in the past a certain way so that we can take that knowledge and bring it forward as we start to engineer parts, maybe again in the same domain. Mm -hmm. I think adding on that, it's also the complexity of the tools that you have that allows you to do that and uh, the learning curve that is needed to learn these tools. Because um, if it's super complex and you have to go far out of your way to do this documentation, to do this formalization of your knowledge that you want to archive or give to other people, then most engineers will be very hesitant to uh, jump on that, I would say. Of, of course. I mean, I, I think today, if we think about the documentation that engineers do, they end up writing a report about their process that goes into PowerPoint or Word or products like this. And uh, I think most of the time, those reports don't actually get read by most people. Somebody reads the cover sheet and then the report goes off and sits in a filing cabinet or on a shared drive somewhere to maybe get reopened in a few years. Or if there's a problem with the part, somebody looks at it. Um, but they go through this whole process of documentation for the sake of documentation, and it's not actually used in the end of the day. And I think that's kind of the difference with the visual documentation with scenarios. Like, well, I can actually very quickly go back and reuse a section of a workflow I used to design one component, copy and paste it. And I have all that documentation of why I did it exactly with the, the, the process steps to create that design or go through that analysis process. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Kind of from the ultimate solution, let's call it Jarvis for a second. How far are we like scenario wise from this, having this ultimate solution Jarvis? I mean, you have AI already integrated. We have kind of this end to end um, mimicking of the R and D process. Like what is missing to get to that next level of generative design? Ooh, I, I think if you asked me maybe one or two years ago, how far are we from, from Jarvis? I, I would have said decades. Um, I think the advancements we've seen with uh, AI technology in the past uh, few years is impressive. I mean, uh, what I've seen even from, you know, we went from maybe two years ago with the stable diffusion and these sorts of tools, pretty getting pretty good at generating images. And then you, I think there's a generating movies was quite difficult. And now two years later, like, the types of images you can generate are just unbelievable. And now you can actually generate movies mm -hmm. um, matching to your prompt. Um, I think what we're going to see in the engineering space is we're going to start to see AI models come to this, this point of Jarvis much, much faster than expected, maybe in the next, uh, let's say, two to three years. Um, but the, the difficulty maybe is feeding in the data to these large language models to understand the engineering process, which I don't think that data set really exists for the most part because traditionally tools haven't been connected together in such a manner to understand, Hey, first comes my design, then comes my FEA analysis, then comes manufacturability analysis, for instance, how do we have an AI model, um, understand these process steps? If it, those process steps were never really clearly documented with access to those tools. Yeah. If you look just at the outputs in these PowerPoints or words or whatever, um, format there saved somewhere of uh, all of your engineering work that gives you just the outputs. It gives you nothing about what is the algorithm used to generate these. Yeah, ex I think that's from my understanding of some of these uh, AI models, the importance of having uh, captions about certain images that fed into this large language model were the crucial part, the crucial aspect to it to understand, hey, this is what's in you know, these, I don't know, 300 million different images um, to understand different uh, aspects of them to then go in and now enable the large language model to generate content afterwards. And that's where yeah, we're really you, missing. Yeah. Do you feel that the physics itself, so the physical laws are kind of restricting what's possible with generative AI? Because I mean, like, okay, you add random noise, maybe generate some images. Yeah. We, we kind of get a statistical models, but then the engineers know, like, let's say we have an old engineer that are using classical methods. They kind of know how to design something. And then how, how can we augment actually engineers and knowing that a part is feasible, let's say from the automotive space, because I feel, I think the physics is playing a huge role in this. And I think generating images or movies is much easier, quote unquote, than generating a part that's actually being used in a car or in an airplane, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. I think 
that is the distinction between generating a part uh, that goes into a car versus generating an image mm. um, that I'm going to post on my Instagram, right? Um, generating a component for a car, you need to have your, your FEA analysis that ties into it. So you're going to generate maybe uh, with a new generative AI model, a lot of designs that aren't really viable mm -hmm. um, because they don't factor in the FEA analysis and manufacturability analysis, costing analysis, all of these different things. And I think ultimately that's, that, that's what needs to feed into these AI models. Now, no technical expert there, so I don't know how feasible that actually is. Um, but we need to start to have all of these aspects incorporated because there is a right or wrong design when you design an automotive component. There's not a right or wrong design when you generate an image in a sense. Yeah, if we look at the foundations uh, about the physics you asked about is there have been many, many, many very, very smart people um, trying to model these physics into some equations to be able to do some simulations, for example, or to be able to like represent reality in some kind of mathematical model or whatever model you want to use. And these tools now exist, exist these algorithms, uh, methods exist, um, but they need to be somehow combined. And right now we see a lot of issues with the combination of those because uh, mostly it's a very um, sequential process um, because these tools are isolated and they look at one part of physics um, in isolation. We have multi-physics tools, of course, but mostly you go from, let's say, a designer with limited FE analysis um, capabilities, and uh, they also don't want to do it or uh, don't have time to do it or don't know how to do it, don't have the tool for it. And then it goes to the simulation engineer, it goes to the manufacturing engineer. And um, through being able to combine all of these in an automated workflow, you can go to much, much higher quality and uh, to yeah, much uh, f further exploration of the solution space than before, because before maybe the complexity of solutions available or the complexity of things that you need to consider and, and decisions that you need to take mm. during the process was not manageable by a human. But now with like real computer aided uh, design or with uh, some uh, different yeah, uh, tools that support you in there, um, it becomes more manageable. Yeah, I think there's also a strong argument that AI will really be an augmentation of human capabilities and not really a substitution. In some cases, it will be, there will be new jobs, but also some people will lose their jobs, of course, but I think it's more really an augmentation, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the complexity, I think one of the questions that might be interesting to the audience is, if I'm an engineer right now, I'm working on my day-to-day -day work, or maybe using an FE solver, whatever, um, how, how do I decide as an engineer or just as an individual in general, when is the right time to learn a new tool? whether that's AI or maybe a low code solution, when do, should I decide to say, Hey, maybe this low code thing, I'm going to check it out. Maybe there's this new AI thing going on. Maybe I should check this one out. Is it more like intuition or should you actually wait for an actual use case to pop up and then say, okay, now I'm going to learn about low code. Like how would you guys approach this? Interesting question because, um, use cases force you to do this some kind sometimes, yeah. but on the other hand, a lot of engineers have innate curiosity and uh, they just want to go and explore everything that is new and everything that is uh, maybe interesting for them. Um, so many probably have just started playing around with generative AI as soon as it became available. Um, with low code, I think less so. Over the last, um, I don't know, 10, 20 years, the focus on programming skills on computer science in engineering degrees has risen definitely. So today, most engineers coming out of university can code in at least one la language. And um, so low code should or could be the next natural step for them to be easily able to learn this new skill. Um, but it needs to be a, a good value proposition for them. What do they get out of it? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I guess we talked a lot about these values um, today. Yeah, I think. How do you see it? And from my perspective, uh, you know, the the best time for an engineer to start picking up one of these tools is when you're you're bored with your current tasks because uh, you've you've had to do it so many times. Your wrist hurts from thinking so much <laughs> in your CAD tool. 
Um, you think there's more innovative ways to solve problems, but you don't have enough time to do it. Uh, maybe you're staring at that backlog of four weeks of simulation requests from your design department um, that they want you to tackle. Uh, these are all kind of nice indicators that maybe now's the time to start looking for other solutions because um, having these four week backlogs of simulation may be the norm at some companies, but for those using Scenera now, it's not the norm, right? They can break down those barriers and allow you to actually focus on the work that you find interesting, the work that's actually going to bring your company forward or bring you forward rather than just kind of maintaining the day-to-day. -day. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Kind of reminds me of what you said, Andrew, of that a software engineering mindset or like when you hack together a script just to automate something, but actually then sometimes you find out that if you, I don't know, when you were a student coding in MATLAB and then you actually realized I could have done it way faster, but this is actually where templates could become quite handy, right? So let's say when I get into generative design or any like FE automation, whatever, um, do you guys offer something like this, like a template where, you're, where I'm going to say, hey, I want to explore FE automations. There is already something available and then I'm going to tweak that template specifically to my to the purpose that I need it for. Yeah, so um, some of my colleagues on the Academy team, they spend their, the whole uh, day working on different types of templates. So we offer full workflow templates covering kind of end-to-end -end processes, but also we focus a lot on uh, what I call kind of little building block templates that you can start to plug into your own workflow mm -hmm. um, to connect multiple of these blocks together um, to solve uh, an engineering problem. Because we know the, the value proposition of, of visual programming is that you don't have to start from scratch all the time. It's very easy to copy and paste and reuse mm -hmm. things between workflows that you've created, your colleagues have created, that we've created for you um, inside a new process that you're trying to create. Any additional thoughts on this, Daniel? Uh, no, nothing to add here. Yeah, I mean, you guys have the Academy anyway, so if anyone wants to check it out, I'm going to post every relevant link in the description so people can get started with Scenario and check out the templates, the Academy. I think you guys have a lot of stuff, so um, that's everything an engineer would need. Um, anything that we might have missed in terms of generative design, guys, that I have not asked you? We talked about the future, the status quo, the problems, the solutions, obviously. Yeah, I think we thoughts? covered a lot of different aspects, yes. Maybe I think for Android, it's going to be because sometimes we work on this kind of marketing language. What do you think maybe marketers do wrong in terms of like promoting or like product marketers in terms of like um, marketing a technical product, especially for generative design where they say, hey, it can do everything. It solves all your pains, all your problems. Is there maybe a tip for the marketers out there for the product marketers who are maybe engineers mm. how to actually market a generative design solution <laughs> and not use marketing fluff? Oh, you, you know, you know my uh, my pet peeve, uh, yes, of, yeah. <laughs> uh, marketing fluff. Yeah, I think I think the challenge is is when we we talk about selling solutions to engineers, we need to provide actual solutions at the end of the day because I think for me, engineers are the most demanding customers out there, right? Because it gets back to this point, there is very much a right or wrong answer, and. Um, yeah, maybe it's a bit of uh, excessive, but when an engineer designs a part badly or performs badly, people can die, right? This is the, the potential outcome when engineers do their job poorly. And so an under, understand it to an extent why engineers are such a demanding uh, people. I think what we need to do for those of us in the generative design, generative engineering space, is we need to make sure that we provide solutions to actual problems, actual problems that engineers have and that we can validate and prove that we solve those problems. And I think that's why at Scenario, we focus so much on, you know, customer success stories that we, we put out there about how people are using our products because it's not enough to say that, yeah, you can design a injection molded component or a machine component. Actually, actually have to be able to prove that we can do that to make sure that uh, engineers will actually adopt a solution like that. Yeah, engineers have to trust your solution to come up with stuff that they can actually use and that is useful. Even in their, um, when they look subjectively on the outputs, they need to say like, okay, yes, this makes sense in my experience. Mm -hmm. And not only read on homepages, like whatever solution it might be, cutting edge, revolutionize, all uh, that kind of marketing fluff. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can't actually prove the value, like show the benefit and only show features, I think 
this is already the wrong approach. Exactly. It's, um, I mean, it's a, a tale as old as time feature selling, right? It doesn't matter uh, for Scenario, for instance, that we connect to Abacus or we connect to Creo or tools like this. Those are just features. What we need to be able to show is that we can use all of those features together to solve a very specific problem. And mm -hmm. if we can show that we can solve a problem, that's what customers end up buying at the end of the day. They don't buy your, your feature set. I think very much are gone are the days where uh, a manager or an engineer will have this requirements list of, I don't know, a hundred different features that they want to see. And they're going through every product and they're going, check, check, check. Oh, no, you don't have that one. Sorry. Um, they want to see that you can solve the problem that they have and not just that you have a, a bunch of features. Because at the end of the day, you may have a feature, but there's limitations to it. And, you know, uh, sales says something exists and works great. And then the engineer tries it. Um, and of course, maybe it, it varies slightly. And sometimes I think what the v VCs want to see is exactly the opposite of what actually end users want to see. This is also a challenge, I would say. And one of the things I really like about the Scenera is like you have on your homepage is saying process automation. So it's a very general positioning, I would say, but still in the back end, um, you still have your kind of product pillars that you focus on. Do you want to quickly talk about like what the, act what the actual focus is for, for you guys at the moment, if you can talk about it? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you said it right. Our, our focus for Scenera is process automation for engineers. So yeah. we're, we're, we're going after this, what we see as a, a market that has been left behind by Zapier and Microsoft with Power Automate to really create a specialized tool for engineers to automate their, their workflows, their processes. And we're starting out by focusing on a few key areas like design for additive manufacturing, really where Scenera got its start with a kind of more uh, nature, nature inspired generative design. Uh, we see a lot of that playing out in the additive manufacturing space where your solution space is much broader, but then we're also focusing on kind of traditional manufacturing te techniques like casting and injection molding, where we see a lot of value for the automotive industry, for instance, to help them accelerate the design of components in this area. And then we look at things like automating FE analysis. Um, you know, I, I have a former colleague that told me. She went into work every day for two years and more or less re-ran the same simulation every time. And we want to eliminate that kind of work from people by having them automate those processes. And then very uh, simplistically, uh, what we call utility workflows. So maybe it's extracting some KPIs or PMI data from a CAD design. Um, maybe it's just changing names of components or analyzing the number of surfaces on a part. There's a lot of these tasks that engineers have to do during their day-to-day -day work that isn't really engineering work. It's, it's yeah, I don't know, uh, organizational work that they have to do. Mm -hmm. And if we can start to eliminate those tasks from engineers' lives, then it again frees them up to focus on doing actual engineering work, which is where they're going to provide value to their companies. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any closing remarks, Daniel? Uh, Andrew said it uh, very well. We have these focus areas. Um, we need to start somewhere, um, build the trust with engineers that we can provide solutions to their pains, to their um, challenges that they're facing. And I think uh, if you go to our website and read through our um, case studies, look at the success uh, videos that are there where actual engineers and their managers are talking about what they could achieve with a scenario, I think it uh, kind of speaks for itself. Absolutely. And I, got, I think you guys are not selling a dream. So this is a really, really nice solution for engineers. All right. All right. Thanks, uh, Daniel and Andrew, for being on the show. Um, maybe that's going to be a second part in the future. Who knows? Maybe about a different topic, but really appreciate you being on the show. And then uh, see you soon, I guess. I Thank hope you. so. Thanks, Joseph. Cheers. Take care.